that drive from Edmonton down to Calgary. And if anyone's ever been on that road before, there's a, it's a very straight road and it's a very boring road, um, with all due respect to the people in Alberta. <laughs> So whenever Brent and I get on those uh, those drives, we have uh, all of these crazy ideas that come to mind, and this is when this one happened. And we said, you know, it's we love the VROC program the way it is right now, but it's limited. It only reaches students during the academic year, and even then, only in select months. Because, well, you know, as an educator, Bob, like you don't want to see an outside organization in September. Um, September is very busy in the classroom. You don't want to see them in December because that's Christmas, January's exams, February's the start of the new semester. Yeah, there's about two weeks in the fall, two weeks in the winter. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, we have, uh, you know, maybe five months a year that we're actively engaging students in the school system. So, what could we do outside of that? And, and you know, I came up with the idea, well, let's, let's try a summer camp. Um, there are a few reasons that we liked it. One was we're able to reach more students. Second is we were able to engage more experts over the summertime. So, uh, yes, they're on holidays, but a lot of them are still around working in their labs. So that was a great story to be able to tell, you know, universities like Laurentian who are partnered with us. We could say, you know, we uh, were able to engage your researchers X amount of times during the year, but uh, we were able to do some in the summertime as well. So uh, more engagement means, you know, the more uh, they get their name out there and the more they, uh, you know, like they appreciate just, it. They just connect with their laptop from home, couldn't they? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the second reason we liked it is when we work with the education system. We're not the driving force behind the connections. The teachers are. Right. And with a summer camp, we're the driving force. So we're managing the camps. We know what kind of activities we run, we want to run and where to go to get those experts. So with those two uh, fundamental concepts uh, in mind, we decided to start the, uh, the summer camp. So we, we started with two last summer, one in Woodstock, one in London. And we picked London because that's where our head office is. And we were very, had very strong relations with the uh, with Western University, and then we picked Woodstock because, well, quite frankly, that's my hometown, mm -hmm. and so it was quite easy for me to kind of keep an eye on things, and uh, and that seemed to work quite well. So we started with those two locations, ran for two weeks in each of those locations, and it was just incredibly well received. So uh, you know, and and from week one to week two, kind of the word got out there, and we actually had to start turning people away because we only maxed out at 20, 20 spots for the camp at the time. So, uh, and the nature of the camp is exactly the same as the VROC program throughout the year. So to give you an idea, uh, a couple of the things that we did, we had uh, tomato seeds that came from space that were germinated on the space shuttle and they came to our, our camp and the kids got to plant these and bring them home and you know, we had an autographed picture of Bob Thurst, one of our, uh, you know, Canadian astronauts and he personally autographed every single one of these for all of the kids, which was phenomenal. So that was, you know, a highly impactful day. So we do things like that. So it's, and then over video conferencing, of course, we would bring in, you know, a space expert. So an astrophysicist or an astronomer or somebody like that. And they would talk to the kids about, you know, space. So how fantastic is that? So we thought, well, this is working really well. And we don't really want to take holidays ourselves because we're a charity. So hey, let's just uh, you know let's open this up and go crazy in the summertime and uh, expand to uh, ten locations. So now we're doing ten locations, ten. and uh, one of them is here in Sudbury, and uh, we're running it for four weeks in July. So we're pretty excited about that. And where's it going to run? It's at the Parkside Center downtown, uh, okay. part of the YMCA building there. Okay, and uh, yeah, it's pretty central. Yeah, the um, people running it are. Local? Yeah, so we hire locally. Um, we had to drive up for this weekend. It's a five-hour drive for us, of course, and uh, you know, limited budgets and all of that. So we pledged that at every location that we're running a summer camp, we're hiring all of the staff from that community. So if you're listening to the show and you want a job, let us know. Good. Um, the promotion is going to be through the schools. You say how many? 20 per week? Uh, 40 per week now. We 40. doubled it in size. Yeah. Um, so you can handle quite a few students then. It's, it's a one week program for each one? One week for each one, so 160 kids in total, or uh, you, know, you can send your kid for all four weeks if you want. The activities will be different every week. Okay. Uh, but uh, cost wise, is it? Uh, it's $200 uh, yeah. per week. And okay. There's some subsidies available as well if you need them. But it's, it's, it's a different kind of program though. Um, I know my uh, eight year old granddaughter took a uh, a one or two week 
course at our program at I think it was Science Northwest. It was science. Yeah. And we were quite surprised. I mean, her her older sister, just by two years, she took a, a dramatic arts summer school oh. program, and, and here this grade one girl wanted to take science camp. Which was it. I mean, one of her friends got in too, but it was it was interesting, different. You don't you usually hear a grade one girls wanting to go to science camp. Yeah, which is so I, I thought it was unreal. Like, that's okay, what we're trying to do. And I had a great yeah. time. Um, so, so that's good. So I mean, so now you're up to ten. You're you're, you're promoting. Are, are you finding? Because we're, we're almost running out of time. Are you finding that the the science, technology, engineering, mathematics careers? Are starting to attract a lot of people that are more in your age bracket mm -hmm. that are looking at shifting careers now or they're looking at uh, at second careers when they get into their late 40s and 50s as opposed to uh, uh, just straight this is what you want to do you find out in grade 10 this is what you're going to be gearing your pathway for because I'm noticing that there's quite a lot of uh, career shifts in, in the population today. People that find out that the career they got into when they were in their early 20s is not quite the career that they got into in their early 20s. It's changed so much that... Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, because I uh, just use myself as an example. I, uh, I graduated with a music degree. And I'm just about as far away from music yeah, right I, I don't <laughs> think you can uh, get too much close to this. Although, yeah. I talked to some musicians that tell me there's a lot of science <laughs> and math and everything in music too. But yeah, and I've also been told that if you're good at music, you'll be good at math, but I can tell you that did not transfer to me. Um, so, uh, it's kind of interesting that I'm running a science-based organization now, uh, according to my parents. But, uh, um, you know, it's funny, I, you know, I went from music to uh, was an administrator at the McMaster University, went from there to the IT field, um, you know, started up a couple companies and went from there to, you know, this project. So, and now I'm in science. So, you know, to your point, um, and I'm, I'm not an anomaly, like there are no. people that we have in our office that, uh, you know, they're on their fifth, sixth, uh, seventh career. Yeah, well, look at the, the colleges, uh, the colleges more than the universities, but the colleges where it's very skill specific. Oh, I'm sure the percentage of, uh, of what they used to call mature students is quite significant yeah. at these colleges now. It's not your 18 and 19 year olds that are walking the hallways. No, that's exactly right. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I've had to talk to, with a lot of the presidents and vice presidents from colleges mm -hmm. over the last few years and they tell me that their average uh, demographic by and large is high 20s. Uh, because a lot of them, you know, um, according to the colleges, I'm thinking of Centennial in particular, told me that they have um, a ton of students who go to university and then realize that they can't find a job for whatever reason in that particular career field. And so they come back and they get some practical training at the college. So that's kind of where the, you know, the colleges are picking up a lot of people these days. And it's going to take it into the career. Yeah, yeah. Not that we're having any uh, impact on that at all, I don't think, because uh, we don't really work too much in that space. But, uh, yeah. No, well, you're dealing in a, in a f number of fields where there is a shortage. Mm -hmm. That basically, if a person is willing to move to where the jobs are, there should be jobs. Indeed. But I, I think when you get again, you get into the engineering field and you get into some of the the science and health fields. Just graduating is kind of like the beginning of your training, and, and that's where um, that's where you put your textbooks to the side and you you find out now exactly how you have to work with this particular company and, and I think that's where the, the mentoring and the apprenticeship is coming uh, becoming so important so so I, I, I can see where uh, as as more and more people find out about the benefits of these particular careers and I guess the the opportunity as opposed to just the fact take it so you can get a job then you're gonna, you're gonna find out before long that you may not have that aptitude for or don't like it or don't like it yeah it's a long haul to, to get there and find out you don't like it after you got all that training kind of expensive too and expensive <laughs> but but i think that this whole idea of providing an outside the classroom resource for teachers is, is huge and, and the way you're doing it is um, like it's it's unique enough that it would motivate students 
Um, this, the, the information that you're providing through the experts is all available. Like if you Google any one of these topics, you're going to have pages and pages yeah. of links that you can go to. Right. If you had to put, put your hand on, on the one particular advantage or a couple of main advantages that people are, are citing as, as uh, why they prefer going to partners in research, what would it be? Have you thought about it? Oh yeah, abs absolutely. Um, well, I'll use a, uh, I'll use kind of a silly example for you. So at uh, a camp, one of our um, activities is building a lightsaber. So that's great. You can download how to build a lightsaber, you know, off the internet, right? You can Google it and, and try it out at home, and that's great. But what if you were at camp and you were building a lightsaber and you got to talk to Darth Vader? I could go so on with that, that but so it's that interconnection. It's, it's that the inter interpersonal. Absolutely, it's yeah. the and it has to be impactful, right? I mean, if you have a speaker that, you know, is is not dynamic, is right. not energetic, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, especially on the age, you know, you might think, oh my goodness, you know, that that career kind of sounds kind of boring, <laughs> right? So you have to be really careful yeah, about who you're putting in front of these kids. Okay, you're uh, getting the wrong message. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. isn't isn't it, isn't it odd now that the, the internet, which most critics have. Uh, have stated is destroying our interpersonal relationships <laughs> is now actually using it to enhance it and strengthen interpersonal relationships on, on a much broader scale that yeah. um, it, it's I mean where it's going who knows well I hope that's the case that's uh, yeah. you know, we're trying really hard to do that Bob. yeah have we missed anything that, that we want to mention about partners in research or the the virtual researcher on call or the STEM camp that you can think of. With this, um, this interview will also be on the Learning Clinic in video form, so I'll make sure that there's a there's a link to the website where people can actually get all the information that they that they want. Um, but uh, it, it is a it's an exciting program. I, I I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that your your four weeks. Will be filled because uh, th this is one of those that, that because it's new, there will be a lot of students that will want to take it. Yeah. For the fact that it, they want to be one of the first ones to have an opportunity to, to engage well, in it. I hope you're right. We uh, we spent the day at the uh, is it the Caruso Center downtown? Yeah, the Caruso Center. Right. There for Family Fun Day, and uh, there must have been uh, you know a couple thousand parents that came through with kids, so we had yeah. some really good response there. That's a good. That's a good uh, good time to be. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> around summer that. Yeah, the Family Fun Day is, is it's an annual event that draws a lot of people. Well, that was great. And one of the activities we had at the table was uh, DNA extraction from a strawberry and a banana. And uh, I had a, a real kick out of showing the kids what that looked like. And uh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. Well, I know you've got to run. You've got a tight schedule today. So Kevin Kugler, uh, Executive Director of Partners in Research. Um, sounds interesting. Uh, and the program sounds interesting. I, 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 I know you're going to be hitting that tipping point before long. It's, it's uh, going to be interesting to see how this program progresses over the next three or four years. It's uh, be my challenge, and if you're uh, if you're in government out there and you want to get behind this, uh, <laughs> dial me up because we're we're looking for ways. Yeah, <laughs> I can I can I can attest to that. Well, thanks for inviting me today, Bob. Yeah, it's been great. And and like I was saying uh, to listeners, if you want to catch the entire interview again, if you go to thelearningclinic.ca, that'll be the easiest place to get the, uh, the link to the video. I, I, uh, partners in Research may use it or, or may link uh, we'll do later that. on, but uh, uh, we'll, I'll definitely get you the, the link to your website as well from okay. thelearningclinic.ca. So you're listening to The Learning Clinic. I'm your host, Bob Kerwin. Uh, with me has been Kevin Kugler, the uh, Executive Director of Partners in Research, and in a few minutes we will have Ryan Cooney with the Canadian Youth Golf Alliance in here talking about his program. So thank you for listening to CQLU, and uh, stay tuned. Well, that was fun. <laughs>